Appearance of Lord Narsimha Dev at ISKCON Mayapur based on a talk with His Grace Atmatatvadas on 24th of March 1948 at 12:20 a.m. 35 decoys armed with weapons and bombs attacked Sri Mayapur Chandrodaya Temple they harassed the devotees and treated them with derision but the greatest shock came when the decoys decided to steal the deities of Sri La Prabhupad and Srimati Radha Rani fearlessly the devotees challenged the attackers how could they see Sri La Prabhupad and Srimati Radha Rani carried away shots were fired a few decoys fell and their plans were foiled Sri La Prabhupad was rescued but that beautiful form of Srimati Radha Rani would no longer grace the main altar this incident really disturbed the minds of the devotees those involved in the management were especially concerned to make some permanent solution this was not the first time the devotees had faced violence and harassment in mayapur his grace bhavanand prabhu who was the co-director of iskon mayapur suggested that lord narsimha dev be installed when the decoys had threatened devotees at the yoga peet Sri La Bhakti Vinod Thakur and his son Sri La Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur had promptly installed Sri Sri Lakshmi Narsingh Dev There had been no further disturbances other devotees in Mayapur were not so keen to follow so closely in these footsteps The pujari must be a naishtik brahmachari and the worship of Lord Narsimha Dev must be very strict and regulated Who would be prepared to worship him Despite such hesitancy his grace bhavanand prabhu was enthusiastic to bring lord narsimha dev to mayapur he asked his grace bhakti siddhanta prabhu and myself to draw some sketches one day quite spontaneously he said that the deity's legs should be bent ready to jump he should be looking around ferociously his fingers should be curled and flames should be coming out from his head I sketched a deity in this mood. The devotees liked it, and His Grace Pankaj Jangri Prabhu agreed to worship him. His Grace Radha Pat Prabhu, a wealthy devotee from Kolkata, offered to sponsor the sculpting and installing of the deity. It seemed Lord Narsimha Dev's appearance in Iskon Mayapur would be a simple, straightforward affair. His Grace Radha Pat Prabhu ji. promptly gave rupees 1 lakh 30000 and it was accepted that the deity would be ready for installation in 3 months i left for south india to get things organized by krishna's grace i soon found a very famous thapati a thapati not only sculpts the deities he is also expert in temple architecture and engineering This man was very obliging until I mentioned that the deity we wanted carved was Ugra Narsimha Dev. He emphatically refused to make such a deity. I approached many deity sculptures, but the answer was always the same: no. I had made a number of trips between Mayapur and South India. Six months had passed, but Lord Narsimha Dev had not yet manifested in his deity form. His Grace Radha Pad Prabhu was very anxious to see Lord Narsimha Dev installed in Mayapur. He asked me to visit the original sthapati I had seen and once again lay dark case. This time the sculpture was a little more congenial and offered to read me a chapter from the Shilp Shastra which is a Vedic scripture based on sculpture and temple architecture that deals with different forms of deities. He read along some verses describing Lord Narsimha Dev a series of verses described his flame like mane his searching glance and his knees bent with one foot forward ready to jump from the altar when he read this i was amazed this was exactly what we wanted i showed him the sketch that i had done he was impressed and offered to draw an outline based on the scriptural description which we could use as a guide for sculpting the deity He reminded me though that he would not carve the form himself. It took him a week to complete the sketch. It was very impressive. I returned to Mayapur and showed the sketch to the temple authorities. Everyone wanted the same sthapati to carve the deity. Once again I was sent back to South India to try to convince him. I went straight to the house of the sthapati. I was feeling very anxious. 
what could I do but pray to Lord Narasimha Dev to be merciful and agree to manifest himself in our temple in Sri Mayapur Dham. I had hardly said two sentences when the man matter-of-factly said he would carve the deity. The story of how he came to this decision is interesting. The Sthapati had approached his guru, the Shankracharya of Kanchipuram, about our request. His guru's immediate reply was, don't do it. When he heard that it was Hare Krishna people from Navadvi, he became very concerned. They want Ugrinar Simha? Are they aware of the implications of sculpting and installing Ugrinar Simha? Such deities were carved over 3000 years ago by very elevated sthapatis. There is a place on the way to Mysore where a very ferocious Ugrinar Simha is installed. The demon Hiranyakashipu is torn open on his lap and his intestines are spilling out all over the altar. Once, the standard of worship there was very high. There was an elephant procession and a festival every day, but gradually the worship declined. Today, that place is like a ghost town. The whole village is deserted. No one can live there peacefully. Is that what they want for their project? The Sthapati replied. They are very insistent. They are constantly coming to talk to me about the deity. Apparently, they have some problem with decoids. Handing his guru a sketch of the deity, he said, This is the deity they want. His guru took the sketch and looked at it knowingly. Ah, this is Ogre category, he said. But a deity in this particular mood is called Sthanu Narsimha. He doesn't exist on this planet. Even the demigods in the heavenly planets do not worship a form like this. Yes, this deity belongs to the Ugra category. Ugra means ferocious, very angry. There are nine forms within this category. They all are very fierce. The one they want is Tanu Narsimha, stepping out of the pillar. No, don't carve the deity. It will not be auspicious for you. I will talk with you about this later. A few nights later, the Sthapati had a dream. In the dream, his guru came and he said, For them, you can carve Sthanu Narsimha. The next morning, he received a hand-delivered letter from Kanchipuram. The letter was from the Shankaracharya and gave some instructions regarding temple renovations. There was a footnote at the bottom. It read, for Iskon, you can carve Sthanu Narsimha. The Sthapati showed me the letter and said, I have my Guru's blessings. I will carve your deity. I was overwhelmed with joy. I gave him an advance payment and asked him how much time it would take to carve the deity. He said, the deity would be ready for installation within six months. I returned to Mayapur. After four peaceful months in the Holy Dham, I decided to go to South India and purchase the heavy brass paraphernalia required for Narsimha worship and then collect the deity. The trip was well organized and trouble free until I visited the Sthapati. I explained to him that all the paraphernalia required for the worship had been purchased and that I had come to collect the deity. He looked at me as though I had lost my senses and exclaimed, what deity? I haven't even found a suitable stone. I could not believe my ears. But you told me he would be ready in six months, I exclaimed. I will keep my promise, he said. Six months after I have found the stone, the deity will be ready for installation. His reply was emphatic, but I just couldn't understand or accept the delay. In frustration, I challenged him. There are big slabs of stones all over South India. What is the problem? He looked at me the way a teacher would view a slow student and said very deliberately, I am not making a grinding mortar, I am making a deity. The scriptures tell us that only a stone that has life can be used to make a Vishnu deity. 
when you hit seven points of the stone slab and each makes the sound mentioned in the scriptures, then that stone may be suitable. But there is a second test to indicate whether a stone is living stone. There is a bug that eats granite. If it eats from one side of the stone to the other and leaves a complete trail behind it, then the second test of living stone has been passed. That stone is living stone, an expression can manifest from it. Only from such a stone can I carve your Narsimhadev. Such stone speaks poetry. All features of a deity sculpted from such a stone will be fully expressive and beautiful. Please be patient. I have been searching sincerely for your six foot slab. I was amazed and a little anxious. The devotees in Mayapur were expecting the arrival of the deity soon. How was I going to explain the living stone search to them? Maybe they would decide to make Narsimhadev from marble. I decided to try to lighten the subject by discussing the Prahalad Maharaj Murti with the Sthapati. Please forgive me, but I forgot to tell you the last time I came that we also want a Prahalad Murti. We want to worship Prahalad Narsimhadev. What do you think? I don't think that will be possible, the Sthapadi replied matter-of-factly. I looked at him, not sure what to say. He smiled and continued, You want everything done exactly according to the scriptures. Your Narsimhadev will be four feet high. Comparatively speaking, that will make Prahalad Maharaj's size the size of an amoeba. But we want Prahalad Maharaj one foot high. I interrupted. Fine, the Sthapati replied, but that means your Narsimhadev will have to be about 120 feet high. We began to argue back and forth about Prahalad Maharaja's form. Finally, the Sthapati sighed in resignation and agreed to make Prahalad Maharaj one foot tall. At least now I had something positive to report when I returned back to Mayapur. After two months, I returned to South India. There had been no developments. I shuttled back and forth from Mayapur to South India every 30 or 40 days. Finally, our stone was found and the Sthapadi became a transformed man. For over a week, he hardly spent any time at home. Hour after hour, day after day, he just sat staring at the slab. He had chalk in hand but didn't draw anything. He refused to allow his laborers to do anything besides remove the excess stone to make the slab rectangular. The next time I visited him, he had made a sketch on the stone. That was all. I was worried. The Mayapur managers were becoming impatient. Are you sure the DT will be finished in six months? I asked in desperation. Don't worry, the work will be done, he replied. I returned to Mayapur only to be sent back to South India to check on the details of the DT. I found the Sthapati carving the form himself with intense care and dedication. At that stage, the stone had gone and the shape had come. The Sthapati had just started on the armlets. He took two weeks to carve them. All the features were so refined and delicate. I was impressed and very happy. It took the Sthapati a little over 12 months to finish the DT. When he completed the work, he did not immediately inform me but decided to visit some friends for a few days. It was the monsoon season, there were few visitors and he felt it safe to lock up Lord Narsimhadev securely in his thatched shed. Two days later, his neighbours ran to inform him that the thatched shed was on fire. There was heavy rain and everything was wet, but the coconut tree roof had caught fire. He ran to the scene to find Narsimhadev untouched, but the shed burnt to ashes. Immediately he phoned me, Please come and take your deity. He is burning everything. He has made it clear. He wants to go now. Enthusiastically, I travelled to South India, hired a truck and half filled it with sand. I arrived at the Sthapati studio thinking this final stage would be relatively simple. I had foolishly forgotten that Lord Narsimhadev is a very heavy personality. 
he weighed one ton. After two or three hours, we managed to lift the DT safely from the shed onto the truck. To travel across the border safely, we also needed police permission along with the signed papers from the Central Sales Tax Department, the Archaeological Director and the Art Emporium Directorate in Tamil Nadu. All the officers demanded to see the DT before signing the necessary papers. Once they took darshan of Lord Narsimhadev, they all became very obliging and efficient. We had all the necessary papers in hand. Within 24 hours, a miracle given the usual quagmire of bureaucracy found in government offices in India. The trip back to Mayapur was also amazingly trouble-free and peaceful. Our protector was certainly present with us. Usually, the sthapadi comes on the day of the installation ceremony, goes into the DT room and carves the eyes of the DT. This is called Netra Nimilanam. It was an exceptional case that our Narsimhadev's sthapati had already carved the eyes. He had not only carved the eyes, he had also done the pranpratishtha, which is installing the life force, a little puja and an arati. I am sure this is why the papers were prepared so obligingly and transporting the Supreme Lord was so easy. He was already present and who would dare to say no to Lord Narsimhadev? The installation of Lord Narsimhadev was very simple and lasted three days, from the 28th to the 30th of July 1986. I remember feeling apprehensive that perhaps the installation was so simple. The grave warnings of the Shankracharya of Kanchipuram had deeply impressed me, but my mind was soon appeased by an awareness of loud, dynamic Kirtan, Sankirtan Yagya. The only true opulence of Kali Yuga was dominating the scene. I felt enlivened and satisfied. Lord Narsimhadev, the protector of the Sankirtan mission, had finally decided to manifest at Sri Mayapur Chandrode Mandir. Sri Sri Narsimhadev Prahalad Maharaj Ki Jai Jagadguru Sri La Prabhupad Ki Jai Nitai Gaur Premanande Hari Bol Hare Krishna